9 million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. grouse in Michigan and it's immediately assumed that you're talking about rough grouse. But there's another grouse in Michigan and it's found only in the UP, specifically the eastern portion of the peninsula. Much less numerous than rough grouse, the sharp-tailed grouse inhabits grasslands and one of the most popular places to find them is in farm fields. Yeah. Come here. Commonly called sharp tails, sharpies or sharps, they get their name from the shape of their primary tail feathers. Sharp tails are more common in the western U.S. and Canada, and Michigan is the easternmost state where you can hunt them. I've been trying to connect up on a sharp tail hunt for some time, so when Eric and Rich said they were heading east for a couple days of hunting, I was more than anxious to make the trip. Figuring out where to go was made easy by the Hunting Access Program or HAPLANDS in the area. Sharp-tailed grouse are found across the eastern upper peninsula and in different places. Um, eastern Chippewa and Mackinac counties probably has the largest uh, contiguous block of open land habitat for them. Thousands of acres of hay and pasture fields primarily that offer a habitat for sharp-tailed grouse as well as other grassland species. So it's kind of a core habitat for these birds. Uh, but they are also found in plains areas or marsh areas, uh, other uh, openings that are a little bit larger in nature across the eastern UP. The hunt area is basically restricted to the eastern Chippewa and Mackinac County agricultural lands in part because that's the most contiguous block and the habitat remains the same year after year. It, it doesn't change very much and is accessible. Um, here we seem to have the, the largest area of um, sharp-tailed presence, if you will. Sharp-tailed grouse hunting was reestablished in 2010 after some survey and research information and uh, with input from an advisory committee to the DNR. And so it's been going on for a number of years now and that was established in about half of the agricultural lands in the far eastern Chippewa and Mackinac counties. The hunting area was expanded in 2015 and includes most of the remaining agricultural lands or field country in the far eastern uh, Chippewa and Mackinac counties. It's a unique opportunity. This is the only place in Michigan that sharp tails can be hunted. The limit is two birds per day, a limit of six for the season for hunters. Sharp tail hunting is perhaps a little bit different than other hunting in the area. Uh, you will likely do a lot of walking across fields and hopefully see some birds. Coming your way. Hopefully have an opportunity at harvesting one or more but um, hunters can expect a lot of walking and um, there's no guarantee of seeing or being able to harvest a bird. They can be few and far between in some places. So the, just uh, something that hunters can expect. 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by the Island Resort and Casino. Bet America Sportsbook at Island Resort and Casino. The Hunting Access Program, or HAP, was initiated or brought to the UP in 2014 to provide some public uh, access hunting opportunities for folks, particularly traveling from outside of the area. Prior to that, hunters uh, coming from outside of the area had very limited amount of public land to pursue sharp tails on. There's actually quite a bit of public land in the area, but most of it is forested and doesn't offer the ideal or, or preferred habitat of sharp tails, the, the grassland or open land type habitat for that sharp tails prefer. 
So um, the HAT program started in 2014 with about 2,700 acres. That program has expanded to about 5,200 acres available this year and we're holding steady at that number um, for last year and, and this year. Right here. The HAP program has been implemented in the area in partnership with the Chippewa Loose Mackinac Conservation District. They have helped with administering that program and dealing with landowners. First UP Sharptail. What was there, about six birds went up just as we got out of the truck. Under that program, landowners have an incentive to allow public access onto their properties. Some lands are open to sharp-tailed grouse only, while other lands are open to small game, including waterfowl. Small game, including waterfowl lands are open from September 15th to November 10th, while sharp-tailed lands are only open during the sharp-tailed grouse hunting season, which is October 10th through the 31st. You get a big male. It'll have a yellow comb above the eye. This one doesn't have one, but it's a nice mature bird, so I suspect that this is a hen. Pectinations for walking on the snow, feathered feet. When a hunter gets to Haplands, they will notice a sign advertising the, the lands or, or marking the lands. And there's a mailbox at those locations w that provide a self-service sign-in. So a hunter would come and uh, sign into the property, go ahead and hunt the property, and then sign out when they leave. When they sign in, maps are available that give a layout of the parcel at that particular site. As hunters uh, enter into a hat property, they will notice uh, small yellow signs marking the boundaries of that hat property. So hunters uh, need to stay within the boundaries of that hat parcel. And again, those would be marked with periodic uh, yellow markers indicating those boundaries. There are resources online as well that hunters can look at uh, when planning to hunt and, and looking at hat properties. The My Hunt website, that's MI Hunt website, provides a good interactive map where hat properties can be found. Um, as you start, you will see stars in the eastern UP area, and as you zoom in further, individual properties will become more apparent. The boundaries of those properties are marked in that system. So it, that's a good opportunity for hunters to look at maps, find out where the hat properties are located. We have about 30 parcels and about 5,200 acres currently available under that hat program uh, to be able to, to hunt sharp tails. Information is also available on the HAP website. The HAP website provides maps and other information about individual HAP parcels. The HAP program has been going on since 2014 and seems to be doing uh, fairly well. Uh, both landowners and hunters seem fairly satisfied with having the lands available. Um, again, landowners uh, get a small incentive to allow public hunting uh, for specifically for these purposes on their <laughs> lands. And um, hunters have a known place that they can come to, especially when traveling outside of the area. So. Uh, both hunters and landowners seem to appreciate uh, the HAP program locally and what's offered through that program. Many of the HAP properties are active agricultural lands, uh, hay or pasture lands. Some of these lands are active with uh, cattle during the hunting season, so hunters need to be aware that um, there could be cattle in some fields. There may be electric fence that they run into on, on these parcels. So just be aware of these as you're out and about. If you're not interested in um, having to deal with some of these challenges, you may select a different HAP site for the area for the day. HAP sites that have livestock within them are still open. We just ask that you please be respectful of the farming activities that go on and, and please keep away from, from uh, those animals as much as possible.
on day two of our hunt, we awoke to find some lake effect on our doorstep. Well, we're heading out for day two. Hopefully we're gonna hit a few more hap spots just north of where we were yesterday. Hoping to get there before daylight so we can see the birds coming off roost and hopefully have a little better idea where they're at before we get there this morning. The sharp-tailed grouse hunt is a bit of a unique or specialty hunt. Um, we do have uh, a number of hunters that take part in, the, in this hunt, but it's not quite as popular as, for example, deer hunting or small game hunting across the state. Yet it provides a unique and special opportunity for hunters, uh, both within Michigan and from outside of Michigan, to come and, and hunt a Michigan sharp tail. Um, we do have hunters that come from all across the state as well as outside of the state to come and, and try hunting a sharp tail. At least you got to see them fly. We just saw some birds take off out of the tree line and then head across the field, so we're gonna walk to where we saw them go in. Sharp tail tend to be a little bit more sketchy than the rest of the grouse, so it could be a shot in the dark, but I think right now it'll be our best bet to get on some birds early. Sharp tailed grouse hunters need a sharp tail grouse hunting stamp in addition to the base license. The stamp is free and can be obtained from any licensed vendor. The sharp tail grouse stamp allows the DNR to be able to survey hunters that participated in the uh, sharp tail hunt and gather information, uh, harvest information and effort and other information that can be used to monitor the hunt and the sharp tail population. Sharp tail grouse hunters also have other opportunities in the area. There's opportunities to hunt rough grouse and woodcock in the area on public lands and some of the hat properties are open to small game so uh, those can be hunted on those properties as well. Uh, there's also opportunities to hunt waterfowl in the area. Aspen went on point over uh, in some thick brush right along the edge of the field just about as we were back to the truck. She broke point, went in, and a whole covey of birds flushed and one came out my way and I was lucky enough to hit it with my loner gun. With two guys hunting, the chances of me following the right one are 50%. It's funny how I can pick the wrong one nearly 100% of the time. That translates to a couple of rough grouse on the tailgate and not on the camera. Yeah, we got to the back of this last field. Dogs got birdie. This bird went up and went down, and then uh, Eric's bird came back with the dogs as well. So we've got three sharp tail, two rough grouse, and probably 20 missed snipe. One of Eric's friends puts it, they're like shooting at bats, so. Uh, so this is my first time sharp tail hunting uh, ever, and I guess I came out here really hoping that we would uh, have some luck and I had a blast. Uh, I was blown away with how many birds we saw and um, just how good we did, how good the dogs did overall. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun and definitely would come back out here for another trip. In spite of the November weather in October, it was still a great trip with some unique hunting and a great part of the UP. Today's Wild Game Break is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. Find out more at cookingwildseasonings.com. Here's a fall tip to get a jump on planting apple trees. In the fall time of the year is actually really good. If you plant them in October, they're definitely not going to grow anymore, but you have them in the ground for the springtime. The bigger the hole with soft dirt in it, your roots will spread out so much faster. Two foot hole is great. If your ground isn't too hard to dig in, you know, make a three foot hole and then put some good soil in it. I try to go with the zone four apples. You don't want to get one that's been dry all summer sitting in the parking lot. Go somewhere where they're taken care of, they're watered, they're sprayed for bugs. They look healthy green. We'll dump a lot of soft dirt around it. Some compost, make sure there's no air pockets. So the next thing I do, I'll mulch it. This will help hold the moisture. 
looks good. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. As October rolls around, it's time to dig out the traps and get things ready for the upcoming trapping season. For trappers, being prepared is of course essential, and taking proper care of equipment is critical to being successful. So here we are in the fall of the year, and uh, uh, if you're going to get ready to do any canine trapping, fox and coyote, the first thing you got to do is get your traps ready. Uh, your traps are the most important piece of your equipment, and uh, by taking care of them properly, cleaning them up, getting all the old mud and dirt off them that probably stayed on them from last year. Most trappers, like if you're like me, you get done trapping in the fall, you like to get done, you hang your traps in the shed. A lot of them have mud on them, dirt on them. Sometimes if you catch an animal, there might be still some residue on there. Especially if you catch skunks, they leave a smell on a trap and you can't really have a trap that, that has odor on it. And you get a lot of porcupines, rabbits, and stuff like that sometimes. So you want to make sure your traps are clean. So in the fall of the year, I guess the first thing you want to do is get your traps out, check them over, and uh, start to do this operation. Now, we always call it boiling traps. They're actually going to simmer them. And there's a lot of other ways to do it. A lot of guys will just take them nowadays and just take a power washer, take them to a car wash, and take a hose, clean them all off. And it's probably good enough. If the traps are in good shape, if you had them cleaned the year before, you probably don't really have to do this every year. And you probably don't have to uh, dip them and wax them every year. Uh, one of the reasons I like to do it is because I just kind of like sitting around a fire at night here and having a cup of coffee and watch the fire burn. So it's kind of like a force of habit thing. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's part of it. It's the right of getting into, getting into the fall season. The first thing you need to do is get some water in your barrel. I usually try to do two dozen at a time, so about a half a barrel is plenty to put two dozen traps in. I already dumped in the mix here. This is called the logwood dye. It's just a powder made from wood. This stuff here is that it would give the trap the dark color. It'll uh, not only help clean the trap, it'll deodorize the trap, give it a natural wood smell, and it actually puts that little black finish on there. It leaves a black coating. In the old days, we didn't have this stuff. We have to go out and get bark from a hemlock tree or an elder bark or um, sumac, bushes, anything that would give off a dye. That's what we used to use before we had the, uh, the process and the stuff that you can buy. Next thing we're going to want to do is get some traps in there. Now, you can make your fire ahead of time, but it's a little easier to put the traps in before you get the fire because it gets a little warm there. And I just hook the drag up here because I'm not too concerned about boiling the drags. Drags on this stuff here. I'll tell you how old some of these traps are. If you keep them from rusting and take care of them, keep them clean. Traps will last a long time. We've had this fire in here going uh, for quite a while, usually just enough to get it simmering for about an hour or two. You don't have to actually boil the traps. We let it cool off now so we can actually work around here. And uh, now it's time to take them out of here and hang them up to dry. I always put a mark on the barrel with an arrow. If you just start throwing them traps in there and then you come to pull them out after, you can imagine the kind of a mess you're going to have when they're all tangled. So by putting them in here in this order, and taking them out in the reverse order, you can take them out one at a time. You don't have to go through all that mess, which I learned the hard way. <laughs> Once they start coming out of here, you see they're wet and black. We're going to take them over and hang them on a drying rack. And uh, again, we got drags on all of our traps for coyote, as you can see. And I don't really get concerned about getting the, getting the drags in the boiling operation, getting them colored or stained because a lot of times the drag, I'm gonna just gonna hide it in the brush. Uh, I probably don't even bury the drag anymore. The main part I want is the trap itself. That's the part that's gonna be where the animal's gonna step. I'm getting them up at the right height here so that when I wanna dip these all, I can dip them real good. Nice thing about the rack that I got here is that it, uh, once I get them all hung up here for dipping, I can go by and I can check each one of them after. Make sure the dogs are all in good shape. 
because sometimes when you catch an animal, you'll bend these dogs from a coyote in here, or sometimes they get twisted, or you might have a one of these pans get stuck and not operating freely. Some of these straps, you'll notice these have an adjustable dog on them. You have a screw in here with an adjusting bolt. You can tighten these up. A lot of trappers kind of like to have a, a tension on their pan. Some like about a two or three pound test weight on there. If you have a lot of small animals in your area, like squirrels, even rabbits, that might get in your get on your trap. Of course, you know, when we're trapping coyotes, it, these traps are covered with uh, loose dirt. You can prevent some of those small animals from springing your trap by putting tension on the, on the pan. But a lot of the old fashioned traps, like this old, this is a number three here, double long spring. These don't have any adjustment on them. These just have a simple set the dog and away you go. Some of these traps I've had since the 1950s when I was first starting to trap as a young kid. And you can see they're still pretty good shape because if you take care of them, they're gonna work. And a lot of times what I'll do before I actually, before I put them in the boxes and get ready to go in the line, I'll go through with a file and check these dogs and make sure they're all nice and clean because you want them nice crisp action. This is the material that they have available at uh, conventions, trap supply companies. It's basically a polymer mix. Similar to a wax, it's called full metal jacket, trap and snare dip. So all you have to do is just dip your trap in there, let it dry. It's a real thin coating on there. It preserves the trap, keeps that trap odor free. And the nice thing about it is that if you do get the trap dirty or you get some blood on it or animal residue or catch an unwanted animal, you can just take the water hose, wash it off, and it'll clean up real good after. It won't retain any of that odor. So we're just going to take this over here and I'll show you the easy way I do this and very simple. Drop that trap down into that bucket, get it in there, flush it around a few times in there. That's all it takes. You just give it a little coating, let it drip off a little bit so you can save some of that fluid. And then when you're done with it, just let it dry off and go ahead and do another one. All you're doing is getting a, uh, getting a light finish on there. It leaves them with a little color coating on them. And when that dries up, it'll be just clear and smooth. Really protects the trap, keeps them from rusting, and mainly keeps them odor free. So you want to make sure you get a good clean trap and a good working trap. If you take care of them, they'll last a long time.